Welcome to our video class today, and we're going to be talking with Andrew Tatler Burgess. We're going to be talking about collecting, authentication, and display of antique collections. So let's yes, get started. Specifically, antique printed artifacts. You know, antique collections is a very broad, yeah, that's true. It's that's a very broad, broad, broad phase. Now, you know, I wouldn't want to. Uh, make yes. any assumptions there. We're sitting here in the gallery part of uh, Valdosta State University's library, and in the background you might see some of the collection that uh, we have on loan to the archives here at Valdosta State. And this is the first exhibition that uh, Deborah Davis has put together um, reflecting the total collection. It's very important, isn't it, Deborah, when you put a collection together that you have some theme or that you have some idea about what yes. you're putting, you know, and why our, you're putting our it theme, up Our theme in this case was broad because the theme was a taste of the collection as a whole. There are right. over a hundred items that have been loaned to us for the next two years that we're going to be working with over time, bringing them out, putting them back, um, showing, showcasing different aspects of the collection as a whole. But this first exhibit was an attempt to give you a taste of whole. That's right. It's, it's really difficult to <clears throat> let people know what we have in any collection and to start off with uh, like a menu, as it were, of what, what is going to be available later that people that are interested can see or have a taste of what will be available and then even prior to any future exhibitions can come to Deborah in this case and ask uh, if they can have access to certain materials. You'll see in what's on display here we have everything from medieval woodcuts uh, through to 19th century botanicals. Um, we have also 13th have 13th century, 13th century and uh, manuscripts as well. I forgot about those. Yeah. You're right, yeah, we, we have some, uh, some, some uh, manuscripts produced in North Europe by scribes, uh, probably in Scriptoria in Bruges, in, in Belgium. Um, I don't particularly have too much knowledge of that. That's not my area of um, expertise in quotes. Um, but I do enjoy seeing medieval manuscripts and, and knowing that somebody four, five, six hundred years ago sat in a room and produced those. And, and they're, they're tiny and they're beautiful. One of the reasons I brought up manuscripts was as archivists, we tend to talk about manuscript collections versus institutional archives collections. In this case, when we say manuscripts, we mean handwritten by scribes. And everything else we're talking about is printed material, very early printed material. Um, That's so, correct. That's and correct. And the term for that is? Well, I'd like, I'd like to get into that term that you're referring to. Uh, there is a word, a Latin word, incunabula which means in the baby's cradle. Um, Incunabula is a term that is used to denote any printed matter that was printed in Europe using movable type between 1450, Gutenberg, and arbitrarily 1501. And I'm very excited to, to say that we also have Incunabula in the collection. We have works dating back to 1482, which is just some 30 years after Gutenberg invented his press. Yes. Um, a, there is a, a, another, I don't know if I could bring this up or you want me to bring this up, but there is another issue with displaying, and that is the protect, you know, protecting. Um, many of the many of <laughs> our artifacts that we're going to be displaying in the future, and you will be displaying as an archivist and somebody that's uh, responsible for displays at BSU will be how do we protect the work, not only from theft, but also from the elements such as ultraviolet light and, and that's, that's things that we have had to think of as we put these materials up. You can't see it around us, but these bright lights have been intentionally dimmed. We've removed uh, lighting in order to decrease the amount of light that's going on these uh, these these things on the wall, and then there's individual spotlights that have been filtered. So 
in before you put up, there's a lot of sort of behind the scenes work that has to happen before you put up a display. But it's absolutely critical to put up a display and to draw people's attention to the works that you have. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's that old, do you say do you preserve it or do you use it? In this case, you use it with as many attempts to make sure that the security is there, the lighting is there, and everything you can do to preserve it as well. Yeah, there's, there's also the framing aspect. I, I, I know um, there will be many collectors maybe or people that donate to uh, works to archives like the one here at BSU and it's possible that those works have been framed in a way that is very unsympathetic to the preservation of that work and we as collectors or, and, and we as uh, archivists will need to know if we have to reframe and be able to assess the materials used. It's important that we use not I mean, acid-free material when framing or, or everything that comes in t contact with that piece of antique, that paper, that, that parchment, that vellum, has to be acid-free and oil-free. Um, it's also important, you will see that a lot of major collections, that if there is an exhibition area that is uh, always used, they will have lighting with ultraviolet filters put in front of them. If that's not available, then antique documents can be framed using glass that has um, a filtering um, mechanism built into it. And we were lucky because most of these frames are good, right? Tell they me are, they're good. They are, they are, <laughs> Tell they me are. they're good. We do have some amount of UV filtering on some of the lights in here, but certainly not all of them. Um, I just want to go back to that point that you mentioned about, you know, when displaying is very important to give, an, you know, some sort of, sort of coherence to the display. Yes. So that when somebody walks around it, they're getting an idea of what we're trying to say as displayers, as the people are trying to put the display together. And, and a lot of that happens from the signage. The signage in any display is absolutely critical. Um, it's got to be inobtrusive but it's got to be there and it's got to make those connections like here's a map. Why is this map interesting? It's interesting because of this particular cartographer and this map over here is by the same cartographer but this map is by his son and this was reprinted. See, you have to do a lot of research to do the signage and it's the research that provides the context inside of which these items uh, rest and, and in which the display talks because otherwise you just got oh it's old right. you know and right. oh it's old is cool enough for mm. some people but for most people you need it's old and why should I care and it's the signage for why should I care what you just said is extremely important I see the these antique documents as a demonstration of the continuum of history. It gives us reference to the past. We sit here now surrounded by things that are hundreds of years old. And we can, by looking and touching at these things, be in contact with our ancestors. It gives us a sense of purpose, a sense of reference. It demonstrates to us that we are not alone and we have a place to go as well. The most beautiful thing about the past that it projects into the future. Uh, when looking at an antique map and you see uh, the images on that antique map, it may not exist anymore, the area that is being portrayed, but you can go into that map and say, somebody has produced this, somebody has sat there, they, they have engraved the copper plate. It's been printed by skilled printers. It's been colored by colorists. It's been collected and bound hundreds of years ago. and. It's been passed on from one person to another person to another person. It eventually ended up here at BSU Archives hundreds of years later. We have this fantastic continuum in history. Our reference point is being demonstrated here in the world, and that excites me. It, it is very, very exciting. One of the things to talk about when we're talking about displays is that even if you have a small collection, even if you have a collection that is not necessarily the most distinguished collection, a good display can take you places you never thought about. For example, 
we were given by our art department an old collection of artifacts that have been collected in um, Ethiopia in the 60s and the 70s, the 1960s and 1970s, by a man who was with the State Department there. And he came through Valdosta and somehow hooked up with somebody in the art department and said, oh, you should have our art. Well, most of it isn't art, most of it is artifact, and a lot of it was created for the tourist trade. But it is a broad, broad collection. And so, because of interest, we were able to show that collection to about 3,000 people a year. And then I had a student that was a professional photographer, and she came down and took photographs of that collection, and we and created a flash, a very fancy flash um, exi online exhibit. And so th we, had, we had basically used the stuffing out of that collection. Well, but we weren't experts in African art at all. We were simply someone who had been given something that we thought was cool and we were going to show it off. Well, years later, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, had seized some rare items with endangered species parts coming in. They were they were from the Songhee tribe. They were uh, tribal masks and tribal power figures and personal power figures. And they had seized uh, something coming in. And then there was a court case. And and anyway, Fish and Wildlife is is supposed to donate these to a cultural institution. When they started looking around for cultural institutions in Georgia who did stuff with Africa, they found our exhibit. So now we have a much more interesting, much more valuable African art collection just on the basis of exhibiting. The more you exhibit, the more things come to you. So that is one of the key things of once you get hold of one of these collections, you just exhibit it as much and as thoroughly as you can. Okay, um, as we go around the exhibit and look at some of the individual items, I would like to uh, give a shout out to Doug Carlson. He was a student volunteer who worked with us and did research once these things were initially described in the database, which he worked to describe them, he then went and did research and found out more and more and more details. And that's why our signage and our knowledge of these pieces is so good, is because of Doug. And he couldn't be here today because he was sick, but we're, we're giving a tribute to him. Oh yeah, yeah, kudos to Doug. I'd like to start with this piece. This is the central piece of the uh, exhibition uh, of today the, in the gallery at BSU Library. We chose as the centerpiece because it is one of the salient pieces of the exhibition. It's a woodcut, a medieval woodcut, um, produced by Hans, um, Hans Bergmeier. Um, it was produced probably in about 1500s. <clears throat> it was used in a publication that was commissioned by Maximilian I, Holy Roman Emperor, called the White King, and it was an attempt at propaganda. Um, the publication actually was not published until much later, until the 18th century, but we wanted to give an idea of the different types and qualities of pieces that we have on offer in the total collection. So we have everything from something as important as this woodcut by Hans Bergmeier, uh, produced in uh, a late medieval, early Renaissance period, on commission by Maximilian I, through to botanicals and and some much lesser pieces, but would ob obviously be of interest to somebody, some academic interest maybe, or an interest to some collector. What what is also interesting to note here is that uh, De Deborah was talking about the information for for each uh, piece and we have a gorgeous display here there's a nice display with a logo the logo runs throughout the whole collection if anybody sees this logo then they're going to identify that piece with the collection so this is a very very good uh, system to use if you have a collection we need to know it's a collection and one of the tools to be able to see that is having a logo that addresses that 
the information on the card too is very pertinent to that piece and as, as in-depth as possible without going too in-depth. We don't want people to just stay here, read that and go away. We want to invite them to access the collection further and possibly come up to the archives and talk to the staff up there and get a better, a better feel of what is on offer up there. And this, the next picture, the Dürer over here, speaks almost directly to this one because yes. they were, you said that they were students. They, they were almost, was a student right. of Dürer, right. Right. Albrecht Dürer. That's this correct. Is, this, this is another salient piece, what Deborah is saying. Um, there were four people <coughs> that, that uh, apparently um, created the woodcuts for Maximilian I's The White King. Uh, one of them was Hans Sprinkley. I know that he was a student of Albrecht Dürer. I'm not sure if Hans Bergmeier was a student of Albrecht Dürer, but he was certainly a contemporary of the students of Albrecht Dürer. Now, Albrecht Dürer, uh, when he was young, um, was one of the illustrators for Sebastian Brandt's Ship of Fools. The Ship of Fools was uh, produced in the 1490s, I believe, was the allegorical work put together that was extremely popular in its time. And this is a leaf out of Sebastian Brand's Ship of Fools with a woodcut that was produced by Albrecht Dürer. This is again an example of what's in the collection. So we have two very important pieces on the main wall. It's very interesting to note that this would be deemed as the main wall. People walking past will see this wall first. This will attract people's attention into the display. And we're hoping then from here we can lead them around the display by positioning certain pieces in a deliberate way. Yes. Um, let's go over here to, these are, these are my favorite, the medieval manuscripts and the botanicals. Uh, some people respond to the maps and some people respond to the botanicals and I'm one of those that just Give me the flowers. Right, they are nice. Gorgeous. <laughs> the nice thing about botanicals, this is a botanical that was produced by James Sobe in the latter part of the 18th century. They are contemporary colored, and that's something that is gorgeous about these. So when you see a botanical like this, it was produced like this and bound like this. You know, the, 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 um, in the latter part of the uh, 18th century and early part of the 19th century, probably going all the way through to the, the middle part of the 19th century, there were they were great naturalists. They wanted to go out and discover. Everybody had a thirst for, 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 for nature and science. So a lot of these botanicals were produced in order to, uh, to demonstrate what was uh, available around the world as far as plant life is concerned. You had Darwin and such going around. And you had uh, you know, the Royal Society, the Royal Academy uh, producing a lot of publications. Uh, James Sobey was one of the major uh, but, uh, publishers of um, botanicals. Um, he studied at the Royal Academy at the same time as uh, James Sower, uh, as uh, William Curtis, I'm sorry, and he has been attributed to as being the colorist and illustrator for uh, William Curtis's Flora Londonensis. But this is a copper plate engraving. So we, we've gone from woodcuts to copper plate engraving. So what we've done too is we've introduced the viewer to woodcut type of printing and now to copper plate type of printing. And this is then juxtaposed with a man manuscript. As Deborah said earlier, um, when we talk about manuscripts here, we're talking about handwritten documents. And this was handwritten by probably a monk in a scriptorium um, in the latter part of the 15th century. Yes, with color and some oh, yeah. gold. It's got beautiful illuminations here. I mean, yeah. they use gold. Um, there has been brown, um, a red color, uh, and, and, and earth colors with, with blue. This is definitely contemporary coloration. This was not added later. And this was done on vellum. So um, going back to um, the security and the protection and preservation of documents, uh, vellum, which is an organic material, would have to be handled differently, say, to, to paper. Vellum is much more susceptible to uh, pollution with oils, and, oils and from the humidity, skins, and, and humidity, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When it's framed, if vellum is framed, it, it can only be hinged on one uh, one place because it has to expand and shrink with humidity, as Deborah was just saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. As we move on, we have other examples of printing techniques and other examples of botanicals. This is a much later botan botanical, a latter part of the, the, the 19th century. Um, it's, it's not hand colored, it's when we got into to mass production and mass, mass produced uh, printing, but it's still rather exciting and it's still empty. And then another medieval manuscript uh, produced probably in Northern Europe, probably in Bruges, but an excellent example of a, a medieval miniature manuscript. What I'd like to do is look at the maps now, because I have... Yes, except for... Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, and this is my favorite. Oh, okay. Thistle. All right, all right. I just right. love the details on the sower bee thistle. Right. Uh, but, but we will not spend time on that. We'll go over to the, the display, display case. case. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. This is a display case that we had brought down because we wanted to showcase, and there was no other way to do it, some rare books and rare porcelain uh, and ceramic materials that were also a part of this collection. And I'm going to let Andrew tell you a little bit about, there's a book of maps, mm -hmm. uh, a botanical, a book of early Christian tortures. <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite that. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to talk about the ceramics first. What we have here is we have two bowls. They are Chinese and they, they date from the Ming Dynasty. This blue and white here is a shipwreck piece and it actually dates from the Emperor Chia Qing. I was uh, able to, to research the mark and, and I could uh, date it to the Emperor Chia Qing, which dates from pr approximately 1550. If you, zoom, if you are able to look at this piece here, this is a piece of Delft blue and white. Uh, this was produced in 17, about 1750. It's thick it's bulky, it's earthenware. I'm not going to say it's ugly, but it's bordering on ugliness. And another thing you'll notice too is they've attempted to put like a Chinese type motif in there. And I'll demonstrate to you the reason why. Down here we have a little tiny bowl. This is a little tea bowl. It's Chinese blue and white. It dates from the first Chi uh, Qing emperor, uh, the emperor Chia Qing. Um, this dates from approximately 1700. It's very, very thin, almost eggshell porcelain. We were unable to do that in Europe at the time. But they were very, very proficient at doing that, and that's why we spent a lot of money then importing these goods from Asia, from China. There are a lot of shipwrecks that they still find, and this is a shipwreck piece, as I said, still has a certain amount of intrinsic value. I mean, that's about two, three hundred dollars worth, maybe even more to, a, to, a, to another collector. This is actually worth more. It's uh, based on a goldfish bowl, but it's a little teacup. It's called um, um, cappuccino, ca cappuccino glaze is what, what we call it uh, in, in Dutch. I'm, I'm afraid I only know the Dutch terminology for that. Um, what, what we also have in the display cabinet are some books, books that the prints have not been removed from and they will not be removed from. I have to uh, say that. I don't want anybody cursing me or something. This is an atlas of steel, uh, of litho uh, uh, lithographs. It's a lot of different maps dating from the early part of the 19th century as German. It's very, very interesting to have. You can see the development of borders. You know, in Europe we had a lot of wars, and during the wars, um, or, or after the wars, land would change. You know, borders would change, territories would change, and that is illustrated in books like this. So it has a lot of historical value to it. The book down here, Deborah referred to as uh, Christian Torches, is actually called uh, the first Christians, the lives of the first Christians, and it was produced or published in 1700, and it demonstrates what the uh, people in the 17th century, early 18th century, thought the first Christians would look like and do. So that has a very interesting sociological aspect to it. And again, then a book of botanicals. It's interesting to note that all of these things are, are framed as individual leaves, they did come out of books at some time. These things were not normally produced to be an individual leaf. All right, now we're going to talk about a series of three very different maps by a cartographer named Blau and Blau Father and Blau Son. Yeah, we have, we, we have this one here. I want to start with this one, which is a beautiful um, copper plate engraving. Um, 
entitled Eilst. Eilst is a small city or a small town in the Netherlands, what is now the Netherlands. Then it would have been the Lowlands. Um, it's from his work called Tonel de Steden, or as uh, has been put here, View of the City, which is a very good English translation for it. What I like about this is the, the relative sizes uh, that have been given to the different um, things within the, with, within the print. You've got the, this, the river uh, through the city, you've got the little houses, you've got the trees, you have a big church, and you have windmills that are quite large, but then you have huge cows. I mean, these are monstrous cows. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that what they're trying to say is that the, the dairy, uh, um, how, how would you put that? The, the, the dairy so, industry. The dairy industry there was very, very important. I think they're trying to emphasize that. That's all I can say, together with like windmills and what have you. Otherwise, why would we have monstrous cows in the landscape? It's really, in that you know, it's extremely interesting to see that. Now, this was uh, Joan Blau, uh, the son. Willem, uh, Willem Blau, his father was probably the, mo the best known of the two. Uh, many people would have seen um, reproductions of his world maps without really knowing it. If you, you usually see them as gold and blue, and they're very, very decorative with a beautiful decorative border around them, and that's usually a Blau map if you see that. But this is uh, a map of uh, the Duchy of Burgundy. What you'll see when you see a, a map by Blau is a lot of detail, a lot of detail, and the detail is extremely good. It's very, very accurate. Accurate. The Spanish were interested in the Dutch cartographers too, and during the 80 years war, a lot of the Dutch cartographers were taken were taken to Spain uh, so the Spanish could have access to the best types of map during, during their travels around the world. And we move on to one more map um, by Blau. This is also by Willem Blau the senior, and this is Magdeburg. And um, again, very, very interesting, a lot of detail here. So you're going to be able to access a lot of detail of Magdeburg from the 16th century. This is just a taste of what's been what's on exhibit. We have we have considerably more maps and detailed things down here, but we also have up in archives about 30 more items under glass that are part of this collection. So now we're going to head on back up to archives. Yeah. We're going to start we're going to start our discussion now about collecting and collections from the point of view of perhaps an individual who's creating a collection or as in our case, an institution that is beginning to collect, mm -hmm. or in your case, a professional. Or a commercial, a commercial, commercial collection, I'd rather yeah. say. So that, I, think, I think, you know, the individual collect collector and the institutional collector are almost the same, I would, I would suggest. Maybe it's just smaller or larger, yes. or you have more or less money to spend. The commercial collector, as I, as I am, is somewhat different because I'm, I'm trying to make a profit, I'm trying to sell mm -hmm. my stuff, I'm trying to access the biggest customer base I can. So I, I need to know what is popular at a given time in a given area and then I yeah. go and access that material. But what's also important for a commercial collector, I think that applies to a private collector and an institutional collector, is I have to be knowledgeable about my product. And it's also a part of my job to educate my customer base. Yes. And in doing yes. that, then maybe I can expand my customer base and expand the, their interest level. So, but <coughs> for, a, for a, a private individual uh, who wants to begin a collection or an institution that is wondering about beginning the collection, I would strongly suggest that they specialize. I would strongly suggest that they do a lot of research find out what specialisms they have in house already, try yes. to uh, decide where their interests are going to lie and specialize. That's, that's very <coughs> interesting. As an archivist, as archivists, sometimes we wind up with general things all over the place from things that people give us. But once you start, once you have your little foot in that door because somebody gave you something, then you can continue to start specializing, mm. and mm. nothing breeds gifts like gifts that have already happened. Right. So. I, I think the strength in specialization is that you're limiting your area that you need to research. You're, yes. you're limiting the area that you need to have knowledge of. 
And certainly if you're an institutional uh, a collector, you need to have a vast amount of in, uh, knowledge of the collections that you have. Or at least you have to have sufficient knowledge to be able to enter into dialogue with other specialists and people that want to do yes. research. And I feel if, if the collections are too broad, it would be difficult then to get that knowledge it base is. that you would require. We've been lucky. We, I mentioned that we have African art. We also have uh, Asian textiles mm. and some Asian prehistoric pottery and some other things. But we've been very lucky to come up with friends of our archives, friends like you, mm -hmm. who have helped us do the research <coughs> and mm -hmm. come up with what we because otherwise uh, we would just be starting out blind. So, so if you're not a specialist already, find someone who is right. and make them your friend. Right, right. Or, or if you decide as a private individual or a, or a small library, say a community library or a small museum or something of that nature, there is no reason why you shouldn't go to your local university archive and say, you know, who do I access? Where do I go? What do you have? Can we collect something that's going to complement what you have so we can access your specialism as well without necessarily doubling up on the, on, on, on the exhibition? That's a good but, point. you know, just, just having some form of complementary uh, mm -hmm. co collecting going on there, you know, sort of pooling resources. That's true. Yeah. That's true. There is that other, me that you mentioned it before downstairs, I just want to bring it up again because I think it's quite poignant to bring that up now. Um, if you become a specialist in collecting and you are known as being a specialist collector, Yes. then you will receive a lot of attention, not only from people that wish to gain information and research materials that you may have, but you will gain a lot of information from pe uh, attention from people that want to donate. That's true. That's been our experience as well with that. And one of the things that we've used the Internet for is a tool to get those exhibits out there, right. to get that out there, and it has brought us a variety of, uh, it's brought us a lot of art actually, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's been a nice thing to get into and start collecting. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, in a, in a nutshell, you know, my recommendation um, would be to specialize, in, uh, to specialize in order to gain as much knowledge as you can in that area, to become known as a specialist in that area, that way you're going to attract um, a lot more colleagues from academia, a lot more professors, researchers from academia and other institutions to you. It's going to promote your own institution as well as your collection and that can do nobody any harm. That's right. And um, if there are areas that need further research and you are known as being a specialist in that, you will be first in line. You know, so this is another reason why I do believe that we should research. Having said that, don't turn anything away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Having said that, oh, I think suddenly I'm going to be specializing in 20th century uh, art. Yeah. We have that big collection of chairs downstairs. Right. And suddenly I have cornered the market on chair art. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have, yeah. And, yes. that and with I love it. Yeah. And I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's nothing wrong um, with that. Okay, why don't we, uh, are we at a good stopping point to move on and look in some close detail yeah. at some of these pieces and talk a little bit about something called authentication. Mm -hmm. What um, I would like to do is, uh, this goes on from collecting, and, and obviously if you're going to collect, you need to know what you're collecting. Um, you need to know, you need to be armed with certain information if you're going to purchase this stuff or things are offered to you. Um, I would strongly suggest, even if you're offered a donation, um, have that piece authenticated before you take it into your collection. Um, there are certain rudimentary things that w one needs to know when, when authenticating. This is not going to be an exhaustive talk on authentication, but merely to whet your appetite in some of the global issues that one needs to know when authenticating, that's all. So and, um, we can move on to that if you like. I would, I would like to, I would say that um, Andrew has a background in, he had a, he had a gallery at some point, and so a lot of what's on display 
comes from his private collection, but mm -hmm. it also comes from his commercial inventory collection. That's right. And having someone uh, with that kind of knowledge around has been invaluable, not just in putting up this collection, but in authenticating for rare books that we've mm -hmm. done uh, and some other things. So. There is, so, I, I'd like to add one more thing before we get on to it. Um, being a commercial collector, I, I only ever researched as much as I needed to, you yeah, know, obviously. Okay. I mean, it would take too much of my time. This is an academic institution, and when the, uh, ex when the, um, the collection came here and when we decided to exhibit the collection here, it became apparent that we needed more information, certainly of some of the more salient pieces, and I was not in a position to be able to offer that information, nor was I in a position to be able to research it. Um, however, there was Doug Carlson, who's a, a, a history major here at VSU. He gave up a lot of his time, and he did extensive research into some of the more salient pieces, and he carries on research now. This is an extremely important part of authentication. Research is needed to authenticate. One needs to know how to research, where to research, and where to access the data in authentication. Where is that black hole? The black hole is okay, the right there. This, yeah. That right there. Yeah. Um, we have here a variety of pieces, everything from woodcuts to Steel, steel plate engravings, mm -hmm. to lithographs, and we're going to show you using uh, a document camera and some, so trying to blow things up a bit, ways of authenticating things to notice about paper, things to notice about ink, things to notice on the front and the back mm -hmm. that'll tell you how old this stuff is. So let's get started <coughs> with this one here, mm -hmm. which is... Well, what I'd like to do is I'd just like quickly to run through um, four basic techniques of printing and just demonstrate okay. those, those to you. Uh, I'd like to start with a woodcut. Um, this is a leaf out of a publication that was published in the 16th century by Virgil Solis. And what you're going to see here is an illustration of the prophet Haggai. This is a woodcut. Woodcuts were invariably used at this early stage. Even though copper plate was available, woodcuts were generally the, the technique of choice, woodcut being the earliest technique. Copper is very expensive and it's very difficult to engrave. They actually had to access the goldsmiths uh, and the goldsmith college to, to learn the engraving techniques for copper plate, but that's something, something different. When looking at a, a, a woodcut, you've got to be able to see if it's a woodcut or not and, and whether or not it's authentic. And you can, you can generally see the way it's printed. Woodcut is relief printing. Can, it is can not we put this sure. up on, the, <coughs> up on mm. the thing and then you can... Yeah, here um, we go. This is, you this can is, oh, go okay. ahead and point. Right. Go ahead and point. Well, what you're going, you you going to see, what I want you to look at are the lines here. I'm going to be talking about those. The distance between the lines, um, how the, the, the lines are brought on to the block, it will all indicate what type of technique it is. What's also in, important to know is there are basically two or three different types of uh, printing techniques. This is relief printing. And by that I mean that the negative part of the image is removed from the wood block, leaving a raised portion to which ink is added, and then it is transferred to the paper. That's relief, paint, uh, relief printing. We'll be also talking about intaglio, which is what is used for copper plate, where the ink is actually applied into the groove, but you'll see a difference later. So knowing that, you're going you're gonna to start to, to recognize what the surface looks like of the ink, where the ink has been transferred. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're going to see a difference in, in how the, the ink is transferred to the paper um, through using a wood block and say using um, copper plate engraving, steel plate engraving or lithography techniques. And uh, after you, you'll, you'll be able to recognize that quite 
quickly actually if you compare them. The best way of doing this is putting a lot of woodcuts together and look at them. Uh, put those alongside known copper plate engravings, put those alongside known steel plate engravings, put those alongside known uh, lithographs and you'll be able to discern the differences in these different techniques very very quickly. So this is a woodcut. One of the reasons we need to know that is <clears throat> a lot of artists favored one technique over another or in a different uh, in different time periods um, different techniques were favored during this uh, period and earlier woodcuts would have been the technique of choice I want to go back down there and okay. actually I'll stay here and bring up a steel plate engraving This is a fine example of a, steel, uh, a copper plate engraving. Copper plate, as I said, is intaglio. Intaglio just means that the ink is applied into the grooves of the plate and then the plate is applied to the paper, pressure is put upon the plate and the ink is then transferred to the paper. This is very, very important to know. But before we get into why it's important to know that, I want to just point out the lines here. If you, can, if you see how the lines of the shading in, this, in, in these different areas has been brought into the copper plate, it is quite different to how they were brought into the woodcut. And you'll be able to see then, after comparing this for a few times, the difference between woodcut and, and, and copper plate. Intaglio requires more pressure. You have to put the copper plate under more pressure when applying it to paper in order to transfer the ink from the grooves onto the paper. And you're going to see an indentation from the copper plate on the paper. You can see here, this is the edge of the copper plate here. Very important to be able to see that and know that. Now, <clears throat> what's also <clears throat> interesting to know is copper is now expensive and it was expensive then. You're not going to expect to see too much copper outside of the area of the positive image. If you do, then that should be a flag. Then you're going to have to ask yourself, was that a copper plate engraving or not? Copper was very, very expensive. You used it just once for, a, for an engraving and, and when it became so degraded it could no longer be used, it, it was disposed of. Um, that brings me to another point. A lot of people when collecting fine art or prints of fine arts, they want very, very early uh, uh, numbers, editions of, of the series, of the run. And it stems from the copper plate engraving. Uh, copper is very, very soft and has more and more reproductions were produced from a plate. The lines in the surface of the copper plate would become degraded and you would get a, a less fine image. This, for example, if you look at the lettering here, they're not crisp at, at all. There's no fineness here. You can see that there's little tiny hair um, uh, roots are missing. They'll be the first to go. This is, this is a late plate. You know, this is not going to be number one, two, or ten. This is going to be number three, three hundred, two or three hundred. Um, when collecting copper plate engravings, uh, one tries to get the crispest image possible and therefore you want a really early, early print. The earlier the print off that copper plate, the crisper the image will be. Uh, you can see there's a lack of crispness everywhere really. It doesn't matter in this. This is an image from Flora Londonensis by William Curtis. He was trying, he was uh, illustrating wildflowers around London, London in the latter part of the 18th century. This is hand-colored, contemporary hand-colored, and we'll show you uh, just in a moment how you can discern that, how you can see that. And um, th this is fantastic quality. William Curtis is one of my favorite uh, uh, producers of botanicals. Um, he published Flora Londonensis, and he published a lot of uh, material on botanicals. Um, it has been rumored that James Sowerby actually did the illustration for Flora Londonensis. William Sowerby and James uh, Curtis um, were at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts together in London. Um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about now is coloration. 
Um, we often see maps that are hand colored. We see a lot of copper plate engravings that are hand colored. They are very oftentimes not contemporary hand colored. And by that, I mean contemporary to the time the print was produced. Um, there is a way of trying to fi uh, figure out whether or not the coloration is contemporary or not. We turn the print over. We look at the back side of the print, and what we're looking for is we're looking for wicking of the color, and we're looking for wicking of the oils of the ink through the paper. And what we need to see, as we see here, we need to see an even wicking. You can imagine that this was applied to the paper, the color was applied using water-based uh, uh, paints to the paper. It was then left to dry, bound, and it's been bound for a couple of hundred years. And over that period of time, the pressure and time has allowed the pigment from the color to travel through the paper. You can see how even it's traveled through everywhere. There is no area where a big blotch, say, of, 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 ink has, uh, of ink or paint has come through. This would indicate to me that this was contemporary colored. I can see no evidence that there's been an excessive amount of moisture added. What a lot of people, uh, what I found also is uh, when people are trying to um, palm off, say, a print as being contemporary colors, they'll turn it over and they'll have pigment to the reverse side. And you can see that very, very easily. You can see the difference. And what you want to try and do is get something like this that is known to be contemporary colored and put it next to what you're trying to authenticate. And you'll see the difference. And I'm actually going to do that now for you. What I'm going to use here is a map that was produced in the seven, well, it's actually written there, 1695. And I'll just flip it over to show you the other side. Beautiful coloration. It looks contemporary on the face of it. We have a copper plate engraving. You can see the plate edge here. Very fine lines are still evident, as you can see here. This was an early run. I don't think a lot would have been printed, and I don't think a lot of publications would have been made of this period. Um, any, anyways, and therefore you would have a lot with the fine lines. These fine lines would disappear later as more plates, uh, as more prints were produced from the plate. So this is very, very early. We have a beautiful cartouche of an elephant here with, with what appears to be contemporary coloration, you know, the pinks and the yellows and the greens. You would expect to see that from that period of time. But as we, done, as, as we did with um, the piece uh, by William Curtis from the Flora London Ends, as we turn it over, we see here the areas of pink. Look, it, it is not even seepage. There's no even wicking there. In fact, here you can see uh, quite a, a large amount of the liquid paint has come through where there's a crease in the page. Now, if this were contemporary colored, it would have been colored prior to binding. Now, this has been folded after it was bound or just prior to binding. So, this would suggest to me that this is not contemporary coloration. This is one clue, seepage at the seam, seepage at the crease. This is another clue here. You can see it's not even wicking through the paper. And again, if I bring this down here, you're going to see the same here. They've loaded on the liquid paint. You see they've loaded on the paint. They, they, it, and, and in an attempt possibly to deceive, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But you can see here that it is not contemporary hand coloration. But what you can also see is the ink, the oil-based ink that was used that has wicked through the paper, and it's very, very even. It shows that typical yellowing. You can see it all around here, an even wicking. This allows us to be able to say, okay, yes, I agree with the period that somebody is saying this was published. It would take pretty much that long to have this type of effect. That together with the paper type, we can see that this is hand-laid paper. It would be contemporary to that period. It is conducive to that period. That's okay. I feel very, very good with that. There's a little bit of repair here, but that doesn't really matter. That doesn't throw us at all. So all in all, looking at the paper, 
printing technique, image technique used, um, wicking of the oil coming through, we can say, yeah, this is pretty, pretty, this is pretty authentic. I'm okay with that. What we also need to need to know is where is it all? Is is does, does that agree with history? If we were to research this, are these countries in the right place? Are the borders in the right place? This is something that we would do with research in order to try and attempt to authenticate this. But it looks quite okay. There is nothing there that throws a red flag that would prevent me from saying, yes, I can authenticate this as being a piece of 17th century printed uh, material. And uh, you, when you talk about contemporary hand color yeah. and non-contemporary hand color, um, does the non-contemporary hand color decrease the value of the item? Not always. It depends. Um, <clears throat> many serious collectors, uh, certainly in the private sector, would prefer to have images that have not been doctored in any way. And adding uh, color at a later period is doctoring. Um, I, I, my personal belief is, and my personal opinion is, if it has been done with respect to that piece, if it has not been, if it has not destroyed that piece in any way, if it has not corrupt the information in that piece, if it's been done sympathetically, I would argue that the value would still be intact. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Are we going to move on to yeah, we're going to move on to another technique. Steel engraving? This is steel plate. Steel mm -hmm. plate. Right. So I'm going to take this out of here. I'm going to lay this on here again. This is a steel plate engraving that I'm going to show you more detail over by laying it here on this document camera. And we can zoom. If you want to go, if you want to go in, the zoom plus is going right. to take you closer and closer. Okay. What I'd like you to see here is, this is a steel plate engraving. What you're going to be looking at here, and, I, and thank you for telling me that, is you're going to look at how fine the lines are. I'm going to move this down. They are extremely close together. They would not be this close together on woodcuts, and they would not be this close together in copper plate, you, when, when using copper plate. Um, the reason is fairly obvious. Steel is a lot harder than copper. And they were able to produce much finer lines. And the other advantage of steel is the lines do not degrade really over a period and they could get a lot more images off. Steel plate engraving really became very, very popular in the early to mid part of the 19th century. When you had a lot of travelers like Bartlett and people uh, 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 like him going abroad and, and producing images uh, of, of different places abroad, they wanted a lot of detail, but they also wanted to produce a lot of books. And it was profitable to be able to use something that would allow them to get a lot, uh, many more images off, off a plate. And steel plate allows that. I don't know how many images you're going to get off a steel plate, but it's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands. Now, a copper plate, you're going to start getting, well, as soon as the first one's off, you're going to get degrading, but you can get between 500 and 1,000 of a copper plate. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. all. That's how limited that yeah. is. But from a steel plate, you're going to get a lot, a lot, a lot more. And a woodcut ad infinitum. It's until the wood degrades or splinters off, and it generally doesn't because it's hard wood and seasoned wood. So copper plate is actually the one that you're going to get a limited amount of prints, and it's actually my, my favorite to collect because of that. You know, you're definitely going to get a limited amount. There's no two ways about it, because the copper will degrade mm -hmm. before you get mm -hmm. a, a decent amount of that. Right. But steel plate, again, so we've seen the difference between a wood cut, we've seen a difference between a copper plate, and we've seen a difference between a steel plate. And this is, this is needed when in, in authentication. I mean, if you do not know what technique was used, you cannot possibly authenticate. Now we're going to look at the most modern printing technique that we're looking at today, lithography. So let's look at this one. Yeah, lithography, um, 
modern in quotes, we'd have to put that. Lithography was actually developed in the uh, middle part of the 18th century, um, but it didn't, came, didn't come into its own until the latter part of the 19th century. Um, lithography, as a lot of people will know, is uh, a technique using stone, pigment and acid, and it is transferred to paper through, through um, a, a press system. Um, you can get as many prints off a stone as you wish. Now, in order to determine whether or not it's a lithography or a copper plate, a steel plate, or a woodcut, we need to look at it very closely. And I'm going to place this now on the, what's that thing called? On the document camera. On the document camera. If we look very closely here at how this has been handled, you can see it just looks like a drawing. It looks like a regular drawing with a pencil or a crayon or such. This is, look at, look at the way that this has been drawn on here like that. It just looks like a pencil movement. This is how it's actually drawn on the stone. It is actually drawn on the stone like that and then it's transferred to, to paper using a, a special technique. Uh, but this is very indicative of lithography. So if you see this, you're pretty much dealing with a lithography. You won't see this type of technique, this type of style with copper plate engraving, steel plate engraving, or woodcut. This again is a hand-colored lithography. This coloration, this coloring has been put on post-printing, and it is contemporary. It would have been done directly after the print had dried, obviously, and prior to binding. Um, it's of brilliant quality. The, the color is fantastic, and, and botanicals generally are. Botanicals are, are well, were created so that people could easily, easily identify um, flowers of the wild or whatever they were talking about, orchids in this case. And you can see the coloration is absolutely gorgeous. And each, the nice thing about uh, a print like this that's been hand colored and contemporary hand colored is each one will be to some extent individual. Um, the way the colorist applied the color is not going to be the same every time. You can see how this moves here, for example, from the pinks up to the greens and to the yellows. The little dots here, they're going to be different on each one. The, the, handling, the handling here, for example, is going to be different. You can see here, this is something happened here. That creates almost like an individual piece, and it, it's, it's, it's quite beautiful. With lith lithography, you're going to get some, um, I'm trying to locate this here. You're going to get some gorgeous shading going on. You know, uh, where are we? I have to find it. Where are we? You are right here. Oh, uh, right here. Yeah. We've got this gorgeous shading going on. I want to bring it down so I can find here. Look at that. This, this, is, this is shallow. This is where you really got an artist working. You know, they placed in this shadow here to create a shadow effect. And I'm going to zoom out slightly. So just you can see a bit of much better view of the totality of what the artist was trying to create. Lithography lends itself to this type of uh, illustration. You've got even the highlights of light gives it almost as it, the effect that it's wet. You're not going to get that. It's going to be very, very difficult uh, to get this type of effect, this type of shading that's going to cause this three-dimensionality with copper plate or with steel plate or with woodcut. This is absolutely a gorgeous, gorgeous technique. So actually, so today we've talked about four basic printing techniques to apply an image to paper. Woodcut, the earliest, copper plate, steel plate, and lithography. We've, we've seen how we can discern the differences between the four different techniques and it's important to be able to do that. Um, if you are purchasing for example uh, something that is supposedly 17th century and you see it's a steel plate you know that it's not going to be true. It's a flag and you're going to look further. So this type of knowledge is indispensable. We, we've, we've given you just a taste of authentication. This is merely a survey. It, we've not gone into any great depth at all, but uh, hopefully this will urge you to in some way see and appreciate the need for authentication, not only when you're putting a collection together, but also during research. If you are unable to authenticate the pieces you are using for research, then your research will not stand up.
Thank you so much, Andrew. This has been uh, this has been our 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 class for you today, and we hope you you have enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. You're this welcome. This is a good class, and I really appreciate your doing it. This is our class for you today, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much.